was a man by the name of John. They actually called him Old John. Now, this is not Old John. This is a random picture. But Old John uh, loved to go to the chapel in the village that he lived in, of course, in Great Britain. And one day, one of Old John's friends stopped him and asked him a question. Now, this guy who stopped him and asked him a question, uh, he was a devout fisherman. In fact, uh, he liked to, uh, he was an angler. Now, I don't know if that's angling or not or fly fishing, so I will let whoever's experts on which uh, A or B, you can tell me after church tonight. But anyway, uh, he asked his friend, he said, listen, he said, I've always wondered, you, why do you just keep going to that old village chapel? Every week, you go up to the village chapel, you go to the same old building, you talk to the same people, you listen to, not the same sermons, but you listen to a sermon every time. And you sing the same old tunes. Now, of course, John said, now wait a minute. He said, don't you, when you go fishing, don't you fish basically in the same uh, river each time? Well, yeah. Don't you fish in the same waters every time? That's right. You know I do. No, you don't, said John. John said, you know, the water uh, that was there yesterday when you were fishing, it's already gone on out to the sea. That's a whole new fresh water. He said, that's how it is for me. Every time that I go, every time that I go uh, to the chapel, the Lord Jesus has something fresh for me. You know, tonight as we think about that, that's how uh, it is for us when we have that unbroken fellowship with Jesus Christ. There's always something fresh. There's always something uh, that is new. Uh, there's something to be said about consistency and constancy. You, you get that sense of uh, stability and security. And when you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, which is by grace through faith in Him, then one of the other blessings of that relationship is that unbroken fellowship. That's a theme. I'm, in, I'm emphasizing it on purpose. Well, that is fleshed out in the life of Joseph. We started a new theme, a new series on Joseph that we will be going through uh, for quite a while. And so Joseph is a person who in the Old Testament had a, uh, had a saving relationship with Almighty God by grace through faith. Because the same God of the Old Testament, my friends, is the same God of the New Testament. And he experienced that unbroken fellowship, even though things change. Now, the picture that is uh, behind me and on the sides is from a movie about the life of Joseph. Joseph, um, if you think about it, just give you kind of background, he was the beloved son. I should have put a picture of his multicolored coat, but I didn't have time. But uh, he was the beloved son of Jacob. Now, Jacob had 13 children. He had 12 sons and one daughter. Daughter, her name was Dinah. Um, and so the youngest son is Benjamin. So he's not the youngest. He's next to the youngest. But he was the favorite son. Well, the other brothers, not counting Benjamin, they were jealous about that. They were actually bitter and angry. And I suspect Joseph, being a teenager, probably kind of uh, rubbed it in their face a little bit. I had 13. At one time, I had 13 first cousins. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, one time we had a gathering at my grandmother's house. Um, you know, I always would tease people it was not a gathering until, until somebody was crying and blood flowed. Uh, there you have it. So I can, I can kind of relate to that just a little bit. However, uh, and, uh, they obviously are going to really do some things that are not, not cool at all. But Joseph and all of that, even when things were falling apart in his life and things were happening and changing that he had no control over. He didn't get a vote. He didn't get a choice. He didn't get nothing. In fact, Joseph was on a need-to-know basis, and God only showed him one step at a time what God wanted Joseph to know. And in all of that, uh, Joseph did not break fellowship with Jehovah God, and, he, and God certainly did not break fellowship with Joseph. So... Um, tonight, as we, I want you to look at the theme of what I call unbroken fellowship. And of course, that's in the life of, of Joseph. You might just say unfriended, but unbroken. Unfriended, but unbroken. There's unbroken fellowship even when he was betrayed. He was betrayed by his brothers. In Genesis 37, uh, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. They were bitter. They were angry. They were envious. They were jealous. And so they beat him up. They ripped that uh, multicolored uh, robe that he had on that was a symbol of his father's love. 
And then they threw him in a pit. They wanted to kill him. But at least one brother kind of talked the other brothers out of killing him. Uh, I'd have never had brothers or sisters. I had 13 first cousins. But um, any, have you ever wanted to kill your brother or sister? I mean, metaphorically speaking, obviously, I would hope nobody would really want to do that. <laughs> Guess what? These guys really wanted to kill him. I mean, come on. you know. And um, it gets better. So they decided, well, we won't kill him. That, that's that. We're just not going to do that. But we'll sell him. And so there was a caravan of Midianites. Also connected to them are a group known as Ishmaelites. Let's just say they're a traveling group. And they sell Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. Shekel is the, is, even today, is the Israeli version of the dollar. Now, some experts say that they sold him for about $6. And that may be true. Although other experts argue that and say, well, no, in modern uh, silver is about, uh, uh, silver dollar is about uh, roughly $10. So if you had 20 of that, you would look, look, be looking at somewhere uh, around the 100 plus mark. So I will say this, that was their blood brother, but they sold him off cheap. He was betrayed by his brothers, yet he did not break fellowship with God. He was not abandoned by God. And Joseph did not abandon the Lord either, even though he could have. In the Bible, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. We'll look at verses 1 through 5. Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 5. It says, after that uh, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer or supervisor of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Because, you know, not only was he sold by his brothers for, for cheap change, he's then sold by the Ishmaelites and the Midianites to the Egyptians, who then turn around and sell him to a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar is an important person. He is the captain of the guard. He is one of the uh, uh, royal uh, military leaders. He's like a general. Well, I would say a general, but he's certainly, he is certainly a commander uh, in chief of a group of soldiers that protect the Pharaoh. So he has power and he has money and he's not afraid to spend it. And so he buys Joseph. How would you like to be bought and sold as if you were a piece of property? That's terrible, okay? And yet, that's what happened in the life of Joseph. And yet, God blessed him. And he had a pretty good life. I mean, you know, he got to be a supervisor in Potiphar's house. But he's also betrayed, not only by his brothers, he's betrayed by his, I call it, boss. I was trying to alliterate, so I went with a B. Uh, if you want to be textually accurate, he was betrayed by his master. But I'm going to call it, he was betrayed by his boss. Um, he was falsely accused of attempted rape by the wife of Potiphar. Potiphar? has him put in, in not just a prison, but in a special prison for Pharaoh's political prisoners. In other words, you ain't going to see a lot of day, son. You're not only in the prison, you're under the prison. And um, it was another change of circumstances. It was another reason that Joseph could have said, yeah, okay, God, I'm done with you. Uh, I, am, I am just totally oh so done. Uh, this is so unfair. And yet, he does not do that. Potiphar even believed the lie that his wife told rather than the truth of, of Joseph's character. He should have known that Joseph, there was no way that Joseph was going to try to do something terrible uh, to his wife, and yet um, Potiphar betrayed him. He didn't believe him. And yet God blessed him. In Genesis 30, uh, chapter 39, verses 21 and 23, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. In other words, even then, something that you would consider to be a, a setback. You're down in the dirt in the desert. I mean, you can't get any lower than that. And yet God is working his plan, although Joseph may not know all the details of that plan, but God has got Joseph's back. And 
Joseph is not letting go of God. Uh, in today's social media, and particularly in Facebook, you can uh, unfriend somebody. Uh, that means that family, friends, or acquaintances are no longer connected uh, to you by that website. Although you may have some limited access, or they, you may be unfriended, but there might be some, some type of limited access. If you block somebody, you should then cut them off. Or just think of it this way. <laughs> he, was, uh, he, was, he was unfriended and blocked by his family and by those that uh, were now his new family, if you want to say that. And he's down in the dirt, yet God never blocked Joseph. And God never unfriended Joseph, although I suspect God didn't have Facebook at the time, but you know what I mean by that. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist preacher of a, what is called a mega church, that would be any, any number over a thousand, well, he actually had several thousand. This was in the 1850s to 1892. He was, he was the big deal uh, back then, long before some of the big TV preachers that you hear about today. He was, he was the real deal. And he was talking to a farmer and the farmer had on his farm a weather vane. That's uh, an instrument that when the wind blows, it's like a little air, maybe in the form of, of an animal or something. And it, it will go whichever way the wind is blowing. It tells you the, the direction of the wind. Nowadays, they have weather vanes that are, are very scientific and can tell you wind speed and temperature and humidity and all that good stuff. But back then, it's just the metal can blow whichever way the wind is. So Spurgeon said, look, you mean to tell me that you think because on that weather vane, which was in the form of an arrow, the farmer had inscribed in big letters, God is love. And so Spurgeon said, look, you mean to tell me that you think God's love is so changeable that it, it just it, it changes and blows any way the wind blows? And the farmer said, no, no, that's not what I meant at all. Whichever way the wind blows, God is still love. That's what it's like with that unbroken fellowship. No matter what circumstances are blowing into your life or what circumstances may be blowing out of your life, God is still love. God is still there for you in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's apply this tonight as we think about this unbroken fellowship. Your changing circumstances. They may be good. They may be bad. They cannot change your relationship, fellowship status with Jesus Christ. He is with you in each and every one of your circumstances. In the good ones, the bad ones, or the so-so ones. In fact, He can turn uh, problems even to a potential. There's, uh, there are times where He can take a mess and turn it into a message of love and grace for you and others. The Bible says in Romans 8, 20, what, 8, 8 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And I'd also remind you, not just of teenagers or children, but adults as well, changing circumstances or opportunities to lean into the Lord, or as Brother Gary's song so ably said it, lean on the everlasting arms, experiencing and relying on that unbroken fellowship. So don't give up on Jesus when things change, especially when you don't get a vote, especially when you don't see it coming. Don't give up on Jesus because Jesus does not give up on you. And you know, sometimes, if we're honest, we get a little angry with God. We might get hurt. We might become disappointed. We might even get bitter. So there's that temptation to maybe unfriend God. Well, God, you let me down, so I'm just not going to pray. I'm not going to talk to you. In fact, sometimes we try to block God in our life, do we not? Just like, talk to the hand. I'm done. And I'm going to go do my thing. And other times, it's not to be so sinister, but on other things, sometimes we have good stuff going on, and it's busy, and, and we get excited, and woohoo, let's go! And the last thing we realize, we done forgot about Jesus. Uh, you know, we left him back here while we're over there. And, 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 you know, maybe we didn't mean to, but, you know, essentially we kind of. Well, we just kind of left him out. If you have unfriended or blocked the Lord tonight, what can you do about it? Two passages of Scripture. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 Psalm 37 verses 27 and 28 say the same thing. Depart from evil and do good. And dwell forevermore, for the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. 
unbroken fellowship with the Lord takes the bitterness out of life. And in time, it makes it better and even blessed. The Bible reminds us, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and should be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. First, John, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor power nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So tonight, as we have an invitation, as, we, as our worship leaders come, I would invite you to come and trust Jesus tonight so that you can experience real fellowship. And it may be that you might need to come back to Jesus tonight. Maybe you've kind of unfriended Him for a while. Maybe you've kind of blocked Him there for a while. But remember, whichever way the wind is blowing, God is still love and He loves you. And I would invite you to come back. Because uh, He does not unfriend you, praise God, and He doesn't block you. He loves you in every circumstance. Maybe you need to come and just pray. Maybe you need a church home. Well, guess what? Chunky Baptist Church uh, can be that church home for you. So I'd invite you to come and enjoy some fellowship here tonight. We'll stand with us as we sing a hymn of invitation. This is your opportunity to respond, whether you're children, whether you're teenagers, or whether you're adults. Altar is open for you. Fellowship with the Lord. <laughs> 